All right. So in the last class we were looking at the specific problem of how to drive a large load if we are allowed to use a chain of inverters in order to drive that load. What's the optimum in terms of the delay? Right. So the problem statement is exactly this. We have some load that needs to be driven, TL. On the input side, our first phase must have some known capacitance, which we will call T0. Okay. We want to find out the number of such stages over here, N, and how big those stages should be. Right? So that now what we can say is at each stage the capacitance is going to be given by C1, C2 and so on, Cn minus 1 with Cl equal to Cn. Okay? Cn by C0 is fixed. Choose n as well as c1, c2 up to cn minus 1 so that total delay is minimized. Right? So, this is the delay from all the way from the first stage up till the final load that we are trying to drive. Okay, this is the exact problem statement that we were trying to solve in the last class. Right? And what we saw was we can write out the total delay as the sum of the delay through each of the individual stages. D0 being the delay of the zero stage, that is the first inverter, D1 being the delay of the next stage and so on. Okay. What are these values actually equal to? The delay of the first inverter is 1, the parasitic delay of that stage, plus the capacitance of the next stage, C1, divided by C0 itself, its own internal delay. Right? Now it is this number multiplied by 3 RC. So instead what I am going to do is just define the 3 RC I will take out as a constant. Right? And I am concerned only with I call the total delay as some dt and I bother only with dt by 3 rc, right? Just for convenience, nothing. The delay through the second stage is going to be given by its parasitic delay plus the load on the second stage, here it is C2. The self capacitance of the second stage is C1. and so on until for the last stage it becomes Cn divided by Cn minus 1 where Cn is equal to Cn the actual load that you want to write. Okay? So what you wanted was to minimize the subject to the constraint Cn by C0 is the constant. Right? And what we saw was how do we do this? We can just take the partial derivative of D with respect to any arbitrary Ti somewhere in the middle. What we will get is 1 over Ti minus 1 minus 
2 i plus 1 by ti squared and this must be equal to 0. This is equivalent to saying ti by ti minus 1 is equal to 2 i plus 1 by ti. Okay. So in other words, what is telling you is, in order to optimize the delay through that entire system, what you want to do is you want to make the delays of each of the individual stages equal. Okay. Now we will call this S equal to C i by C i minus 1. After they are all equal, so it doesn't really matter which one is. Okay. This means that the total delay becomes 1 plus S plus 1 plus S and so on. N times 1 plus small s. Okay. And also we have C1 by C0 times C2 by C1 times C3 by C2 etc. up to Cn by Cn minus 1. This is f to the power of n and this is the constant. I'll call it capital S. Okay. So finally the delay is given by n into 1 plus small s right where small s equals capital S to the power of 1 by n with capital S being a constant for the given problem ok so we can try and optimize this, right? How do we get the minimum value for the delay? You differentiate it with respect to n. Okay? Now n is actually a discrete quantity. It is supposed to be either it is supposed to be an integer, right? But for the sake of computation, we will take it as a real values number. Differentiate the delay with respect to n. And once we have that, we can then sort of make the approximation that look, we actually need the closest integer. Okay? So, what is d by dn? This is going to be 1 plus s plus n into derivative of this. Right? So that is s power 1 by n ln s into minus 1 over n square. Right? Because c by dx of a power x is a power x into ln a. Okay? So I am just making use of that over here and writing out the x square. Once again put capital S equal to S power N and simplify this, this becomes 1 plus S minus 1 over N into S minus 1 over N square into N ln small ok or equal as the So this is the condition that needs to be satisfied for the optimal value of delay. Okay? I could have rewritten this in terms of small n and capital S, but it doesn't matter. Essentially what we have is we have one unknown, either small n or small s. They are related to each other by small s equals capital S to the power of 1 by n. Okay. 
So uh, finally got an expression in terms of small s, that is sufficient. Once I have computed it, I can find out small s also. Okay? So now we just need to solve this particular equation to find out what is the optimal value of s. Right? That s itself is an interesting thing. It is ci by ci minus 1. It is telling you how big should every state be compared to the previous state. Okay? in order to get the optimal value of delay. Now, if small s is equal to 1, there is actually a problem, right? Because it is sort of saying that for optimal delay, every state should be of the same size. In that case, how do I drive a large load? There is no really good way of doing it. Okay? But in this case, it turns out that if you actually solve this equation, small s is not equal to 1, right? This equation is a bit tricky to solve. There is no sort of closed form as such that you can get. The best is probably an iterator solution. And what you will get is the optimal value of x from this, by right? solving this. It's somewhere around 3.6 or so. Is that clear? Right? You can do this calculation. You put in 1 plus 3.6 is equal to 3.6 into log of 3.6, you will find that they are approximately equal. Right? So now what does this mean? Effectively, intuitively it is telling you that in the ideal situation for minimizing the total end-to-end -end delay, every state should be 3.6 times as large as the previous state. Okay? If I have an inverter, minimum size unit inverter over here, the next size should be around 3.6 such inverters. Okay. Now in practice, 3.6 inverters doesn't directly make sense. You can of course get something which is 3.6 times that size. That is possible because after all you can change your WN and WP. But in practice, what we say is rather than worrying about this 3.6 number, we say okay, that's approximately equal to 4. Okay. So it's sort of like saying that at every case, if I have one inverter, the next case if it has four inverters, that is the sort of optimal growth in terms of how I am driving a large load. Okay? Ideally, at each case, we have a factor of 4 growth. Okay? And what is n in that case? n is equal to Now, in practice, it turns out that, you know, I made that approximation 3 instead of 3.6, I take the ideal growth per factor that is equal to 4. You can do the calculation and sort of find out how much is the deviation that you are going to get. And it turns out that for anywhere, that smallest factor being anywhere between around 2.5 to 6 or so, the amount of variation in the total delay that you find is only about 10% or there. Okay? So, to get an answer within 10% of the optimum delay, you have quite a wide range of smallest that you can choose. Okay. Let's apply this to the ideal case that is to the problem that we were looking at earlier, where we essentially said Pn equal to thousand times. Now, remember this was the problem that we took. We considered the case where we have three such cases, each of the factor of 10, 
Now we know that 10 is not the ideal growth factor anymore. The ideal growth factor is closer to 4. Okay. With 10, what is the delay that we found? Thirty-three times three hours. Okay, thirty-three times fifteen people. Right, but the thirty-three is the important point over here. Now, let's equal to four. Let's say, what are we saying? This is one. The next inverse is of size four. Next one. Is of size 16, next is of size 64, then we have 64 that's for the super cases. The next one beyond that will be 1024, it is greater than 1000. Okay? So instead of that, it is directly the load capacitance system. And what's the delay through this case now? What we have is 1 plus 4 for the first case, 1 plus 4 for the second case, then 1 plus 4, 1 plus 4, 1 plus 4. So, actually, for the last case, so this is the first four stages are 1 plus 4 because the next case is 4 times the last. So the last case is only 1000 by 2 per second. This is around 3.9 also. Right? So 1000 by 2 per second is 4. 3000 by 2 per second is close enough. 3.9 of that. Okay? So what we have is twenty four point nine. Okay. What was the delay when we use the factor of 10? 33. When we use the factor of 4, 24.9. If you use the factor of 3.6, it will be something slightly less than 24.9. But if you use, let's say, a factor of 2, right? Then we have 0, 5, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, and then finally the load. What happened? Is this good or bad? Is the delay going to be more or less over here? It's going to be 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2. So effectively, 3 times how many stages? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay? So approximately 3 times 10 or around 30. Right? So what happened in this case? There are so many stages that the parasitic delay through each case started becoming the problem. Okay? So when I chose S to be too large, 10, what I found was each individual stage delay was large. There were only three stages, but each individual stage delay was somewhat large. When I chose S to be very small, 2, then each individual stage is small. Right? The delay, the intrinsic there load, delay due to external load is only a factor of 2 over there, but then the parasitic becomes a problem, right? So that the total delay once again becomes 30. When I choose S equal to 4 in between or 3.6 ideally, that is the sort of sweet spot, right? The delay is optimal, neither too large nor too small, the balance between the External delay versus the parasitic delay is perfect at that point. Ok? 
Okay? Alright, so this is the problem of how do I choose, how do I drive a large flow? Okay? Assuming that I am allowed to use as many inverters as I want. Right? And this is actually an important point because it comes up a lot in digital design when you are doing actual physical design. Right? If you find at any stage that the delay through some particular segment is very large, you need to go and look at it. Why is the delay here large? Because the capacitance is too high. Okay? Whatever I am trying to drive is a large capacitance compared to what I have. What do I do about it? I need to reduce that delay. I can't just bring down this capacitance because it was large for a reason. Maybe it was a register file with 32 inputs. Okay? And I want to select all of them. In such a situation, I have to be able to handle that large delay, large capacitance. So, I insert some extra buffer. Okay? A buffer in CMOS where in output is equal to input is actually hard to build. The simpler thing is an inverting buffer. Right? Something which gives you output is equal to complement of the input. You put two of them together, you get a proper buffer. Right? So, inserting some kind of buffering element, either inverters or regular buffers, will allow you to drive large loads. That is what this is telling you how to do. Okay? How do you choose the optimal number of pages can be derived in this time. So, it is clear that What we will be doing later is taking an extension of this for arbitrary case. This is a sort of special case when you are talking only about inverse. Okay? The next problem that we will consider is more different kinds of gates, land gates, north gates and so on and under that situation when we have arbitrary case, what happens to the delay and how do we handle it. Okay? Alright. With that let's move on to the next problem which is exactly that. How do I build arbitrary gates in Sino? Okay? So, so far I know how to make an inverter. There is one NMOS transistor, one TMOS transistor. Connect them together you get an inverter. Now what I am interested in is other kinds of case. I start with a two input NAND case. Okay? What is the proof table of the NAND case? There are two inputs A and B and one output Y. The output of the NAND gate should be when the inputs are 0, 0, the output is 1, 0, 1, also 1, 1, 0, 1. When it is 1 1 alone, the output of the NAND gate is going to be 0. Okay? Now, the other possibility that we could have considered, which normally people would consider a simpler one, is just the AND gate. So, the AND gate is just the inverted version of the NAND gate or rather the other way around. The NAND gate is an inverted version of the AND gate. AND is considered a more basic logic case, at least from the point of view of Boolean logic, the way that we normally understand it. So, why do we consider the NAND gate and not the AND gate for implementation? Huh? Why does it require less number of runs? What is it fundamentally that makes the NAND easier to implement than the AND? Huh? 
So this is by the way related to one of the problems that I hope all of you received the email about the problem statement, right? So that's a tutorial set of questions that have been put up and also some assignments that you need to do in Python magic. Okay? Did anyone not get that email? Please raise your hand. Okay. Are you on the Moodle site? Do you have access to Moodle? Okay. Can you please contact the DA at the end of the class? Make sure that they know about it so that they can then send you an email about it separately. Okay. I need to figure out how to add you to the module, but in the meantime, please make sure that you contact the PAs regularly and get the updates from them. Okay. So, one of the problems in the problem set, in fact, the first question asks about what is meant by an inverting case. Okay. And essentially, what it is saying is when the input is right, the output is going to be false. Okay. The very nature of CMOS, the way that it is constructed, means that the NMOS transistors are good at pulling down the output, the CMOS transistors are good at pulling up the output. Okay? But it's the NMOS transistors that turn on when the input goes high. And it's the CMOS transistors that turn on when the input goes low. Okay? So because of that, effectively what we have is any circuit that I am trying to construct will be such that when my input goes high, I can have something where the output goes low. Input going high, output going high is actually going to be more complicated for me. Right? Because I can't do it using just the NMOS transistor. And input going high, I need to figure out how to sort of turn off the BMOS so that the output goes low or rather the output goes high, if I want it to be that way. Okay? So, because of the nature of the NMOS and CMOS transistor, when the input goes high, the NMOS turns on, pulls the output low. When the input goes low, the CMOS turns on, pulls the output high. CMOS structure, right, the circuits that you build using CMOS, have an inverting property. Okay? Or in other words, it's more easy to build inverting gate using CMOS. That's not to say that I cannot build an AND gate. How do I build an AND gate, uh, AND gate using CMOS? Take the AND gate and invert it. Okay? It will be two stages. That's the only difference. Okay? So here we are talking about single stage gate. Something where I provide some input, I directly want to get the output. I don't want to have two stages of logic over there. So if that is the case, what does the NAND gate look like? I want this figure here. Okay? If any one of the inputs is zero, I want the output to go high. Okay? And the output should go low only when both of the inputs are low. Or rather, the output should go low only when both of the inputs are high. Okay? Let's first look at this in terms of switches. Output should go low when both the inputs are high. Okay? So I have one switch over here, another switch over here. These are both regular switches. Controlled by the input A and B. On the other hand, I have these other kinds of switches, which are the negative switches. When the our input is low, these switches will turn on. So if A is on, the output will automatically be pulled up. If B is on, also the output will be pulled up. Right? If A and B are both low, also the output will be pulled up. Okay? And during any of those conditions, these two transistors, these two switches at the lower part will be off. Okay? 
So, convert this into the transistor level implementation. What I have is two PMO transistors. when both A and B are high and I have this section which is active when both either one of A or B is low ok the lower part for obvious reasons is called the pull down network or CDN and the upper part is called the pull up network. Okay. So this is the typical structure of any schema based logic case. There will be two parts, there will be a pull down network and a pull up network. And you need to figure out what are the corresponding connections so that whatever logic that you want is real. Okay? Now the interesting thing about this is it's no longer limited to something as simple as a NAND gate. You can take any arbitrary gate, something much more complicated, and provided that you can write it in an inverting form, you can straight away draw the logic corresponding to that. Okay? So let's take a more complicated example. That A dot B plus C is a normal piece of logic. The bar across it makes it inverting. Okay, effectively what it says is anything where A and B, anything where they are going high, the only possibility is any of the inputs going high, there is a possibility that the output can go low. Okay, now if I had a more complicated expression, A times B bar plus C the whole bar, that is no longer you can't call it an inverting gate anymore because you have a B bar over there. Right? How do I get B bar in the first place? I need to have another inverter. So it's no longer a single stage of logic. Okay. It is still a perfectly valid circuit. It's just that it's not going to be a single stage of logic at that point. Okay? So A dot B plus C the whole bar. How would I create the pull up and pull down network for something like this? Let's go about this doing it systematically. First look at the output. Under what condition should the output go low? Let's do that first. Okay, because it's a bit easier to understand. When A and either B or C are high. Okay, that is the condition under which the output should go low. Okay, so there is an AND condition. A AND something must be high. What does the AND condition translate to in terms of switches? There should be two switches in series. Okay. But the second part is saying, okay, we don't want both B and C simultaneously to be high. It's okay if both are high, there's no problem. But I only care that at least one of them should be high for the pull down to work. So put them in parallel. So it works as a OR functionality. pull up network. For that one way of looking at it is to look at Y bar. Right? Consider the situation where 
everything has to be inverted. I want the exact opposite of this to take place. Right? So, in practice what ends up happening is, the two circuits, the pull-down network and the pull-up network are going to be the so-called duels of each other. If one is in theory, the other is in parallel and vice versa. Okay? So, whatever is in theory in the pull-down network, you put it in parallel on the pull-up network. Okay? So, in other words, A in parallel with something. What is that something? B and C were in parallel in the pull-down network, so they should be in series in the pull-up network. is a dual of the pull-down network. Dual means a complement. Anything that is in series in the pull-down becomes parallel in the pull-up. Anything that is parallel in the pull-down becomes series in the pull-up. Okay? There are still one or two questions open over here. For example, why did I put A over here and not A underneath? When they are in series, it is entirely possible to have A with B and C below it or B and C on top and A below it. Okay? This is the right choice from a logic point of view, both are exactly the same. From a circuit behavior point of view, there will be difference. Okay? So in some situations later we will look at examples of those differences, but for now either one is correct. Okay, both are perfectly valid. It doesn't matter that you choose D and C or C and D. The order does not matter. What matters is in the pull-up network, the B C combination is in parallel with the A. Front. Whereas in the pull-down network, it is C. Right? Okay. So, the next question that arises, once we know how to build arbitrary circuits of this type is how do we choose the sizes of the transistors for such circuits? Okay? So for that let's quickly briefly go back to the inverter. What is 4 and 2? I'm just using this 4 and 2 in order to, or, you know, sorry, let me be a bit inconsistent here. Okay? I call the NMOS. to be a unit n that is to say of size 4 by 2. Okay? Whereas the PMOS is double of that size. It is of size 8 by 2. So it is not that ratio 4 by 2 or 8 by 2 that I am concerned with. I am concerned with what is my definition of a unit inverter, unit transistor. Okay? So the n over here is a unit transistor of size 4 by 2. The PMOS is not a unit size, it is size 8 by 2, double the width of the NMOS. Why did we choose that? So that the current that can be delivered by the PMOS becomes equal to the current that can be delivered by the NMOS. Right? Two things happen because of that. One is the VM, the midpoint voltage, becomes close to the by 2. The other thing that happens is the propagation delay on the rising and on the falling side. Right? What happens to the propagation delay on the rising side? If the current delivered by the PMOS, 
charging whatever capacitance you have plus whatever parasitic charges. What happens to the calling delay? Whatever capacitance is there has to discharge through the NMOS. Okay? By choosing the PMOS to be twice as wide as the NMOS, what we have achieved is they become equal. Those two transition times become equal. Okay? So our choice over here was pretty much on the basis that how do I make those two transition times equal? Okay? We we'll use the same principle by choosing the sizes for arbitrary gauge for Okay? So we want to make the two transitions equal. More importantly, we want to make it equal to that of the so-called reference inverter. Right? The current delivery capability, we want to make it equal to that of the reference inverter. So with that in mind, let's look at the NAND gate. in the pull down network. There are two NMOS transistors. I want the total current that they can think to be equal to that of the reference inverter. Okay? This is my reference inverter. For that to happen, what do I need to do? What should the size of the NMOS transistors be? If I keep them as 1 and 1, that is to say minimum size, then what happens to the current delivering capability compared to the reference inversion? It's as though I have two resistances of value R that are being put in series. What is the total resistance as a result? 2R. What do I want? I want R. So how do I get the total resistance to be R? Make each individual one of them R by 2. How do I make the resistance as R by 2? Double the set. Okay? So make both those transistors double size transistors. Okay? What about for the CMOS, the pull-up side? Here what happens? There are three possibilities. A is 0, B is 1, A is 1, B is 0, or A and B are both 0. Okay? Among the three, this is the worst case. Worst case meaning the one that will result in maximum delay. Either A is on or B is on, but not both. Right? So you have three possibilities. Either A is on, B is off, or A is off, B is on, or both are on. Okay? So when that happens, what you need to do is consider the worst case. The worst case is when only one of them is on. Right? Because when both are on, it's as though you have two resistances in parallel with each other. What happens when you put two resistances in parallel? The effective resistance is half of the individual resistance. So that's a good condition, a lot of current can flow. So instead what we have is, we consider the worst case, any one of them is on. Now under the condition that only one of them is on, I want that equivalent resistance to be the same as for the reference inverter. So what should the size of the beam of transistor be? Same as in the reference inverter. What size was that? 2.
in which case what should the size of that one be same as for the reference in body but if b or c the pull up for the left hand side has to be active b and c both have to be off and the total resistance over there has to be equal to r so each one individually has to be r by 2 4 and 4 should be the size okay once again over here is all three a b c are on then you have better than worst case but worst case is always taken care of by the choice of transistor type yeah W by L of the PMOS is two times of the MOS, correct? Yeah. So make resistance same. I make W by L of the PMOS to be twice of the MOS. Correct. So the capacitance is a different story. I can't fix the capacitance, right? Capacitance is the same whether it's rising or falling. It doesn't matter. It's double, but the same capacitance is seen whether I'm doing rising or falling transition. Okay, so the delay will remain the same whether I make the capacitance more or not. It will be the same for rising. It will be the same for falling. So even if I add some extra parasitic capacitance, it will affect both. It will affect both rising and falling. But the resistance will affect only the current. That is to say, the rising time of the falling time. I don't want them to become different. I want them to be as close as possible. So I make only the R values the same. The C will be different. The C will become more, but it will affect both the rising as well as the falling. So it does not matter. Okay. All right. We'll stop here for now. In the next uh, session, we'll be starting with the concept of logical effort. which is the same kind of thing that we did for the case of the inverter but generally to more arbitrary types of cases